Hi, my name is James Griffiths. Welcome back to the channel. And today we're going to be looking at annoying hit singles that eclipse the albums they came from. Now, this video was inspired, uh, as many of my videos are, by listening to a particular record. And the record in question is this one. This is Fairground Attraction with their album The First of A Million Kisses, which came out in 1988. Really fine debut album, one that I had not listened to for a long time and uh, featured the stunning voice of Eddie Reader. And um, then he made this one album, I think. There might have been a second one, I'm not quite sure. But the big hit single from this was the song Perfect, the second song on side one, which is a lovely song actually. But it struck me when listening to it that it is far from my favourite song on the album and it's also the most obvious one and I was thinking this thing about hit singles you know back in the day artists frequently in the 70s and 80s or the 60s they wouldn't necessarily write a single they would just write a batch of songs and in amongst those songs one or two or three of them would be catchier than the others and often the record company would choose that to be the single so it would end up being the single if it's a catchy single it gets played on the radio a lot and when things get played on the radio a lot they do um, become a Annoying. Now I don't think this song really ever became annoying but um, it's definitely got that catchy radio friendly quality to it and I guess what can sometimes be annoying is that catchiness, just the way that certain songs lodge in your brain and catchy hit singles tend to be very broad stroke in their emotional reach. Uh, they don't necessarily touch any subtle emotional receptors in your brain. Everything's very widescreen, very obvious. That song, I think, would be an example of that. There are some other songs on the record which are far more subtle, far more evocative I think and um, what does tend to happen is because you get a song which is so huge it therefore comes to define that album and when you're flicking along the shelf and a record like this comes by you look at it and you kind of go oh yeah that's the album that's got perfect on it don't really need to hear that again I probably won't give that a spin uh, and then when you do give it a spin you realize or you remember actually there's a lot more to the album than that so um, as usual I thought to myself if I can find 10 I'll make a video and in the end I found 20 <laughs> I'm not going to do all 20 uh, but I'll do some of the ones that um, jumped out at me so just to be clear well most of these songs I don't hate them I don't dislike them but I could definitely see how they could be seen as annoying and I do find them a bit annoying at times even though I like most of them as we get further up the list towards the top three or four slots we're going to hit some songs which I genuinely find annoying and which I don't like uh, but most of these ones uh, don't fall into that category so the one that immediately sprung to mind uh, my favorite band of all time Squeeze and Cool for Cats this al uh, this um, single Cool for Cats was derided at the time when it came out the enemy called it a silly bugger slice of noise and it's a novelty song and it did not particularly uh, encapsulate what Squeeze were about at the time. It led to lots of kids turning up at their gigs, which I think they were a bit um, discombobulated by. It's got a bit of a disco groove to it. It's got a bit of a novelty chorus. And, you know, if you'd only heard that one song by Squeeze, you wouldn't really kind of know what they were about. Lyrically, maybe you'd have an idea, but you wouldn't necessarily get a, a glimpse of the breadth of their music. And this album certainly contains some stuff which is much... Um, much more sophisticated than Cool For Cats. Obviously this album also had Up The Junction on it, which was the second big hit single from that album. And that one was not annoying. It, you know, it, didn't, have a, it didn't have a very obvious hook or a very obvious um, novelty element to it. Squeeze actually had another album uh, containing a sort of annoying radio hit single, Babylon and On from 1987, which features some really fine material. You've got songs on here such as Footprints, which was a single as well, actually. Tough Love, great song. Uh, on side two, you've got Cigarettes of a Single Man and The Waiting Game, both fine songs. But the song which defines this album was the big radio hit in 1987, Hourglass, which is very catchy, quite annoying, quite repetitive as well. This is the thing about these radio-friendly singles. They do tend to be quite repetitive. 
Now this next one, there are some people who literally can't even listen to this band because of this particular song. You know, there are some bands who, it's not just that they have albums which are eclipsed by a annoying hit single, their entire career sometimes becomes eclipsed by it. This is one that immediately sprung to mind, Prefab Sprout from Langley Park to Memphis, which contains the juggernaut hit at the start of side one, the king of rock and roll. I know Richard McCook cannot stand that song, and as a result of that, he's pretty much stayed away from this band. I. Uh, I've always really liked it. I can see why it's annoying, and it's nothing like it's nothing like as good as their best stuff. If, if you compare it to Bonnie or Appetite or even Cars and Girls from this record, it's very much a novelty, catchy hit single. And um, you know, I don't think anybody really should uh, dismiss Prefab Sprouts just because of that song. Uh, but it certainly came to define them in the '80s, and it's you know, it's the most famous cut from that record. This guy's uh, uh, like Squeeze uh, had two. Thomas Dolby uh, with his great first album, The Golden Age of Wireless, which didn't even contain the annoying song when it first came out. This is the original version of the album, which uh, begins with the song Flying North. Then he had the hit single, She Blinded Me With Science, which is a novelty synth hit single, which had Magnus Pike on it. I love it, but I can see how it could be, it could be viewed as annoying. Um, so the second press of the album came out with that song at the start of it, and uh, that song now really has come to define that record but it's uh, you know it's far from the best song on the album this is an album that's got songs like airwaves which is one of the greatest synth pop songs of all time and then this one is maybe an even more guilty candidate uh, his second album the flat earth which has got some absolutely brilliant songs on it you've got dissidents the flat earth itself an incredibly moody great great song um, side two you've got white city uh, Mulu, The Rainforest, and I Scare Myself, which is a cover version, but then the album ends with the big radio hit single Hyperactive, which is quite annoying, sticks in your mind, but not necessarily in a good way. I like it, I'm a Dolby fan, but I can definitely see if that's the only song by him you'd ever heard, and then you saw this record in a charity shop, you might think, I'll give that a miss, I'm not sure I want to listen to him based on the strength of that. And uh, <clears throat> staying with the synth pop thing, an album which I totally love, and a song which I totally love, and which goes straight back to my childhood, but I must admit it does have that radio-friendly, annoying quality to it, mainly because of the female backing vocals and the way that the chorus just repeats endlessly. The Buggles and The Age of Plastic, and um, Video Killed the Radio Star was a huge hit single in the UK, and launched Trevor's career really, Trevor Horn, but there are so many better songs on this record which I totally love. Elstree on side two which is fantastic, Johnny on the monorail at the end of side two, and uh, I Love You Miss Robot at the end of side one. Wonderful, seminal synth pop songs. Video Killed the Radio Star, it's a fun song, it's a happy song, it's a clever song I think, but it's um, I think it is a bit played out and it does have a very obvious hook to it. Staying with Trevor Horn, this is a record which nowadays gets dismissed unfairly, I think, and people often say that the hit single from it was the only thing on it that was worth listening to. I don't agree with that. I would probably say it's the best song on the album, but I don't think it's fair to uh, dismiss the whole album. Uh, I think the song eclipsed quite a lot of other good material. This is Yes and 90125, which was produced by Trevor Hall, and it was their big comeback album. The monster hit single on this, Owner of a Lonely Heart, which um, is just, again, has that very catchy, radio-friendly quality to it. Great riff. Uh, it's a song I really like, it's one of the greatest hits of the 80s, but uh, I wouldn't agree that it totally uh, means the rest of the album is not worth listening to. The track Leave It on this record on side two I think is one of the greatest production jobs Trevor Horn ever did, it's marvellous. Um, I also like It Can Happen on side one which has got a really pumping chorus and City of Love, the second to last track on the album I think is, uh, is definitely worth your time. Uh, not a great album all the way through consistently, but it's definitely got more to offer than um, Owner of a Lonely Heart, and yet that's the one which always gets played on the radio. I think British radio, you know, it's different from radio in the States. We don't have radio stations which, you know, during the day play album cuts. The only thing that DJs play during the day is singles, so you'll get an artist. This is a great example. This is an album which I really, really like, The Clash and Combat Rock. It's quite a moody album, uh, it's got stuff like Straight to Hell on it, a bit of a kind of post-Vietnam kind of sultry, uh, slightly ominous kind of ambience. 
Um, but it's got the song Should I Stay or Should I Go on it, which sort of leaps out like a bit of a sore thumb, really, when you listen to the album. It's a good song. It's one that I enjoy hearing when I've had a few beers in the pub, but it, 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 it's it's very obvious. It's got a very obvious riff to it. It's got a very kind of catchy, incessant kind of chorus, and um, it kind of does sort of eclipse this album a little bit. When people think of combat rock, they think of, oh, yeah, that's the one with Should I Stay or Should I Go? The other um, hit single from this, kind of less so, is Rock the Casbah, which again does have that radio-friendly quality, but that's not one that I get tired of hearing, really. It was a big song in my student days, that. I used to hear it a lot uh, here in Lancaster, but um, that's not one that gets old. I'm still on the songs here that I really like. This one is one that I kind of, you know, I do have to be in the mood for it, and I do think it unfairly eclipses the album, really. Ebony and Ivory from Tug of War, which... I don't think it really sums up what this album is all about, really. It's a bit like the Cool for Cats song at the end of Cool for Cats. This album is one of his greatest uh, achievements, really, a great personal statement after the death of John. Ebony and Ivory clearly is a song with a bit of a political conscience going on, but it's quite saccharine. I like it. I'm a, you know, I'm a big Paul McCartney fan. I'm not going to diss the song, but I can absolutely hear how it could be bracketed as an annoying hit single. And um, for casual fans, that may be the song which they associate with Paul from this era and maybe um, which they associate from this album this one another favourite song of mine from back in the day and one that I can still listen to but again I can I can definitely hear how it's played out Free Fall In from Full Moon Fever I don't think is anywhere near the best song on this album <clears throat> if you compare it to things like a face in the crowd on side one, which is a great ballad. Some cracking stuff on part two. The apartment song. I even really like Zombie Zoo now, although I never used to. Great version of Feel a Whole Lot Better by the Birds. And yet yeah, it's free falling. It's free falling and I won't back down, which you always get on the radio. But free falling in particular, I think, because it's such a simple song or deceptively simple. It's got that repetitive thing going on. It's just the same thing over and over again. And I can definitely hear how people might uh, might get sick of that fairly soon. And it's the song. When you think of Full Moon Fever, you think, yeah, that, that's the album that's got Free Falling on it. You don't necessarily think, oh, yeah, that's the album that's got a mind with a heart of its own on it, which is a great song. <clears throat> but um, had to include that one. This one I was in two minds about because we're now actually we're now into. Um, actually, no, no, we're still on the songs that I really like, actually. Uh, we haven't quite got to the ones which I do find annoying. But this one, um, XTC from their... Is it their fourth album or fifth album? English Settlement, which was the big double album they made in whenever it was, 1980, 1981 with Hugh Padgham. It's got a great range of tracks on it. It's probably a bit too long as an album, but the big hit single, Senses Working Overtime, I mean, that's the song that everybody knows by XTC. <clears throat> it's got a big obvious chorus to it. It's quite strange as well, this huge radio-friendly chorus bursts out of this very strange medieval-sounding verse. They don't sound like they belong together at all. I don't know whether it was deliberately written by Andy Partridge to try and be a big radio hit, but it certainly sounds like one. And uh, on this album, it's you know it's it's far from my favourite song on this record. No Thugs in Our House, I think, is a much better song. Uh, but um, I mean, you can't deny since it's over time. It is a very well-written song with a great catchy chorus, but uh, it does have that quality. This next one, um, this song I loved back in the day, and it's a bit of a guilty secret for me uh, because um, you know it's a song which has maybe got a bit of a checkered history. Eric Clapton from 461 Ocean Boulevard, his cover version of Bob Marley's I Shot the Sheriff, which I first heard on the um, the compilation album Time Pieces back in, it would have been about 1987. I'd never heard the Bob Marley version at the time, and I really liked it. I still... I still do sort of like it, but I can definitely hear how it's an annoying radio hit. It was a big song for him. I cooled on his version of it quite a lot when I learned that he didn't like the song. I always had it in my mind that Eric was, you know, he was a big uh, reggae fan, a big Bob Marley fan, and he wanted to champion the music. It turns out that's not the case at all. The song was brought to him by one of his band. He listened to it and didn't like it, but he was persuaded to record it, uh, after which it became a huge hit. So there we go. Later on, Eric met Bob Marley backstage at a gig and Bob Marley told him he really liked the song, so there you go. It's still a bit annoying and, you know, most people nowadays would say, yeah, let's, let's, let's not have Eric Clapton singing I Shot the Sheriff. But this album, this is a classic album, uh, it's got some great stuff on it. Let It Grow on side two, um, Please Be With Me is a great song, Motherless Children, 
you know, this album's got a lot more to it than I Shot the Sheriff, but um, that was the biggie. <laughs> and uh, Eric's friend and confidant through the years, George Harrison, I guess this one needs not much introduction. Got My Mind Set On You is the big hit single, and this album has got far, far more to offer than that. Um, you've got That's What It Takes, which has got a wonderful Eric Clapton guitar solo. Fish On The Sand is a great song, which you'll never hear on the radio in this country. Devil's Radio, great song. Um, but yeah, Got My Mind Set On You, catchy chorus, sticks in the mind, very obvious. Got a bit of a fun, wacky video behind it. And uh, to lots of people now, when they see this album, they see the picture of George, they immediately think of that video and of that song. So, but I still like it. So the last three, the last three are ones which I do genuinely struggle with. And this first one, for a long time, this was the only song I knew by this guy. And I really didn't like it very much. It was, a, it was a novelty song, it was repetitive, just kept doing the same thing over and over again. And it's always been played on Radio 2 in this country during the day. Jeremy Vine is a big fan of it. He's a radio DJ who has a kind of news current affairs programme during the day, every weekday. And he'll play this. He, he plays it all the time. I get so tired of it. But then uh, I heard the album. This is Warren Zevon and Excitable Boy. John Heaton sent me a copy of this a couple of years ago. What a great album. My favourite song on it is um, the title track, Excitable Boy, which is essentially is a song about a psychopath who grows up as a psychopath. He's a psychopath as a child. He commits all these heinous crimes. And the song gets darker and darker and more and more disturbing. But it's got this very kind of jaunty piano-led arrangement. It's fantastic. I could listen to it all day, you know. Um... Werewolves of London, less so. On the album, I don't mind hearing it on the album so much, but still, it's not a song which I like. If I hear it on the radio, I think, oh, God, turn it off, you know. And it, I think, it, again, it's just got that obvious quality to it. Sounds like a song which has been deliberately engineered to stick in your mind and get on the radio. Uh, but I might be uh, doing it a disservice, because obviously, you know, Warren was a great artist, and I do, I do really like his songwriting. Uh, so the final two, yeah, don't like these much really. This first one, I don't think this is a top tier album really by this guy. It's from his great period, but I think it's a lower tier album from the great period. Um, Elton John, Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player, which has got some good stuff on it. It's got Daniel on it, which, uh, of course, which was another uh, single. Teacher I Need You is a nice song uh, on side two. Uh, I'm going to be a teenage idol. Uh, High Flying Bird at the end is a, is a really great song, but the second to last track, I'm sorry, but Crocodile Rock, uh, I just think it's just really annoying. It's got that kind of synth at the beginning of it, and it's a really catchy, annoying chorus with a falsetto vocal. I don't really like sort of teen, 50s American rock. I just find a lot of it just really naff. When I hear it, I just think, oh, you know, thank God the Beatles came along. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of that stuff, really. I like Little Richard and, you know, proper rock and roll, but I, 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 I'm not a big fan of some of that 50s stuff. And this is a kind of nostalgic novelty song with that really annoying uh, falsetto vocal. Huge hit single. I think it was his first top 40 hit single in the States. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's one that I can live without. And um, finally, this one, this actually makes me feel quite guilty again, because this is a really, really good album by one of my favourite bands of all time. Um, Steely Dan, Can't Buy a Thrill. Um, it's got some of my favourite Steely Dan songs on it. You've got uh, Kings on side one, which is brilliant. Uh, Only a Fool Would Say That, which is probably a top five Steely Dan song for me. Even the stuff which is, you know, not sung by Donald Fagan, like Dirty Work and... Um, uh, da -da. Brooklyn Owes the Charmer Under Me, really nice songs. But the one song on this album that really I just don't like is the big hit single, um, Reeling in the Years, which is their most famous song, really. I just find it just totally like, da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. are you reeling in the years, stowing away the time? After you've heard that a couple of times, you think, yeah, oh, don't want to hear it again. And the guitar solo in it, which Jimmy Page really loved, it's just one of those solos that just goes on and on. The song is repetitive, it's radio friendly again, got that catchy thing going on. There's a million Steely Dan songs that I love, that is definitely not one of them, and yet ironically it is their most famous song, and it's probably the song that defines this album more than any other. Just a couple of honorary mentions. I didn't pull the records off the shelf. I couldn't find my copy of this one, actually. But um, You Can Call Me Al from Graceland, uh, which is one of my favourite albums of the 80s. That song is annoying. You hear it in supermarkets all the time. It's got a bit of a annoying, repetitive, 
sort of horn section which might be a synthesizer I'm not sure and the other big one is um, Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel which is again it's a good song I like it but um, many years ago I remember drinking in a, in a bar in Leeds and that song came on came on the uh, you know the the tannoy whatever you want to call it and there was a dance floor in the corner and there were these sort of drunken office executives sort of dancing to Sledgehammer and one of them was this sort of fat guy who was clearly trying to cruise in on this girl and it was it was quite an unpleasant sight and Sledgehammer was playing at the time and you're thinking oh god you know of all the songs that Peter Gabriel did really Sledgehammer is that his finest moment is it even the best song on uh, on so you know you've got Mercy Street on that record you've got Red Rain anyway you get the idea right so there we go those are my suggestions I'd be interested to know if anybody has any others I know there are some others lurking around but I thought I'd better uh, confine myself to those <laughs> rather than this video running on too long so we've hit 20 minutes that's easily long enough thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next video